say it's also more intimidating. So usually I don't see the audience, and here I see my old colleagues, I see customers, I see people that I follow on Twitter. So I, uh, yeah, in either case, uh, my name is Mario Kuczynski. I'm a serverless engineer at Steady. Uh, I spelled it out here as serverless engineer, but we only do serverless, so actually for us it's engineer, but that gives me a bit of a preview. And I will be talking today about uh, how we actually reduce toil with serverless. So I'll give you a bit of an introduction to what the company is that I work at, uh, uh, what it is we're working on, and why we're so excited about serverless. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Who actually heard about Steady already, maybe as a test? A couple of people, okay. So for those of you who maybe don't know, um, Steady is, let me see, yeah, that works. Uh, so we are a startup, we're a Series B funded startup that is rebuilding the technical backbone of the B2B economy. What that basically means is we are building solutions that make it easier to make to do B2B trade. So an example of that you can see at the bottom of this slide. Uh, you can imagine that you know, there's millions of retailers worldwide and a lot of distributors and a lot of producers. If you, for example, order something from Amazon, that would be the retailer that is buying stuff from, for example, Apple or a different type of retailer. And we are basically in the business of ensuring that these connections between retailers and distributors to, for example, send invoices or in order to make back orders, that they can happen as easy as possible using serverless technologies. Um, so I'll, I'll have in this presentation actually a couple of solutions, but I'll also show you actually how we built this under the hood and what, what some of those benefits are. Um, yeah, and as a bit mentioned already, we leverage server serverless for everything. So there's absolutely no exception for that. There is to my knowledge, no container, no instance, or nothing like that hidden within the company. Uh, everything is basically enforced to only use things like Lambda functions, step functions, event bridge. And then for example, for websites, we also heavily use single page applications so that we also don't have to maintain any web servers over there. So now that you have a bit of an idea of what Steady does and what the space is in, I wanted to make it maybe a bit more tangible, even though this slide is probably very difficult to read in, in, uh, uh, here in the room. But we're basically trying to solve these transactions between retailers and, and for example, uh, third parties, uh, where a protocol called EDI is being used. Has anyone ever used EDI here? Or actually a couple of people, so potential customers maybe, who knows, we'll talk. Uh, but basically how EDI works is, this is actually a specification that you see over here for a so-called purchase order whenever you place it with Amazon.com. So Amazon also uses this, for example, in their logistics uh, uh, processing and in their back ordering. And basically what it looks like, it's a lot of data. It's basically a huge schema with all type of fields that you need to fill in. There are, for example, details in there, a bit maybe similar to how Dave was saying, there's details in there about the, you know, the order ID, the customer uh, address, um, how, for example, the products should be packed. You know, should it be bubble wrap or should it be in a box or whatsoever? How do we handle returns? How do we handle basically everything around this type of order? Uh, and it is a protocol actually, as you can see maybe a bit on the left hand side, if you can read it, so maybe the first row. Uh, it's, it's, it's very like human unfriendly, right? So basically it's been built in the 60s when I think it wasn't really well considered yet uh, that humans actually need to build this and kind of like start working with it. And in many cases actually, the, what you see on the right hand side, that is basically the specification that for example, a party that you will need to interface with will give you. So for example, you wanna become a partner of, of Amazon or Walmart or Target or any of the other big retailers, they will basically give you this PDF that is often 20 pages long or more, and they will tell you, good luck, this is the schema that you need to send events to us, you know, let us know when it works. Uh, and often actually those type of retailers also have quite a lot of power in that relationship. They basically tell you, conform to this very complex schema whenever you place an order or it won't work. So, what we actually are doing in that space, we've, we started creating a lot of tools to basically make that easier. Uh, what you see over here is a very, I would say, opinionated and the paint specific tool where you can actually start translating these very complex files into a JSON and into something that's a little bit more usable. So this is just to give you a bit of a flavor. You know, people that are actually working with EDI get wildly enthusiastic about this because this space is basically a mess with a lot of, you know, handcrafted payloads. Uh, you can also take a look at all these products on our website with, with the URL mentioned below. So let's talk a bit about AWS and a bit about serverless. Um, we're basically today, so I'll give you first the state of what it is that we do today and what we offer. We basically have today synchronous APIs that, that customers can use to make this process a little bit easier next to some of these graphical tools I was just showing you. So, you know, a lot of these architectures are actually pretty similar and also very 
uh, uh, lightweight and very lean and mean because this is a you know, low margin and high volume business typically, where we very often use an API gateway, a Lambda function, and then a DynamoDB table if there's any sort of state. Probably not a surprise if you've worked with serverless before. However, one of the things that we did actually start doing as kind of like a tenet and to also provide more value towards our customers is that we're starting to use multi-region pretty much for every product that we ship. Uh, so some of you might be aware, you know, AWS has fantastic reliability, but also in, in, on some occasions does have a bit of downtime. So one of the strategic choices actually that we made on all of our APIs is to go multi-region by default. So it's not like a bolt-on or whatsoever. It's something how we actually ship it. Um, what you see here on the slide is basically a very simple architecture of how that looks like. So you recognize the API gateway, the Lambda function, and the DynamoDB table. But what's different over here is that actually between region A on top and region B on the bottom, we replicate with DynamoDB. So we use global tables there to basically give us near real-time replication. Uh, you basically just, you know, you tick a box and DynamoDB basically in the background will start replicating data for you. Generally, we see that there's like a 500 millisecond delay or something like that. So if you're, if you're able to work around that, uh, basically you can build applications quite easily there. And then on the front door, we use root 53. So that's the DNS service from Amazon to also load balance in between these service. So there's basically, you know, one endpoint that customers can hit on steady.com. And then we actually route them depending on the latency to the, to the closest region. Now we actually, I wouldn't say coined this term, but I like to use this term called region pairs. Uh, and this is actually the first region pair that we are running. So the services that I was mentioning before and a couple of future looking ones are actually replicating between US East 1 and US West 2. Uh, and there's a couple of you know, very clear benefits, I would say, towards that. One of them is higher availability. So even though AWS regions typically are very highly available, incidents do happen. There was, for example, a rather large one, I believe, in November or December in US East 1. And what's actually interesting when you use this latency-based routing is that one region can take over very quickly. So, you know, whenever there's, for example, imagine right now that, uh, I'll knock on wood, but uh, imagine right now that one of these regions would go down. Typically what you will see is that there's actually maybe, you know, a minute or so that events might be still routed to the uh, impaired region, the region that isn't working anymore. But very quickly after that, so let's say within one or two minutes at best, uh, traffic will be able to resume and customers basically do not have any impact from this. The other one that's actually quite nice, that's the second one that I listed over there, is that there's also an insurance between quotes for broken deployments. So while, for example, AWS might have sometimes issues and we kind of overcome that, we also make issues sometimes. Uh, so we actually recently had a case where there was a broken deployment, something went wrong in the deployment in, uh, towards one region. The funny thing is actually that the persons, the people on call started seeing that one of the regions was impaired. So it started showing a lot of errors and basically, you know, the region stopped working. And without us actually doing anything, we had a failover to the other region. So customers actually didn't really see it. We saw like a handful, literally less than 10 requests that were dropped that customers had to retry. But for the rest, we actually kind of survived without any, any problems, this, you know, self-inflicted issue that we had created within our pipeline. Uh, and just to notice, the pipelines are completely separate, right? So that is one of the things that we do to actually isolate them fully and to then route customers to wherever they are. Another benefit uh, over here as well is actually lower latency. So even though this EDI space is not typically very latency sensitive, so of course there's, you know, there's a lot of volume typically, uh, but it's not that there's like, you know, uh, uh, that customers really expect super, super, super quick responses, but it's actually an interesting side effect that we see, for example, that our customers based in Asia pack, they typically end up at US West 2, where it's sort of 200 milliseconds faster for them. And customers, for example, from Europe, which is a bit more on the right-hand side, they typically end up in Virginia. So we have kind of like this extra benefit as well that actually the user experience becomes a little bit better. And then a question that you might actually have is, well, you know, might be expensive, right? Like you're replicating a lot of type of things. It could be in your case, right? So in our case, actually, we replicate pretty small data objects. It's typically like kilobytes per user that actually in state needs to be, needs to be stored. And in our case, I'll tell you more about cost later on, it's actually a very, I would say, you know, low and, and acceptable cost addition that you do. So yes, you do pay more for this replication. Is it worth it at the end of the day when you, when you compare it to these other benefits? I think it is, especially with the availability thing where basically, you know, you can imagine if you're an on-call and 
there is some sort of uh, uh, issue, for example, in one of these AWS regions, you basically have a lot of trouble, right? You maybe need to very quickly scramble and deploy in a second region, or you maybe need to do some sort of cutover. Basically, our on-call, technically speaking, could sleep over one region being down. Like, probably we'll still wake them up just to check, but because it's the first time we're doing this, but uh, normally speaking, it should be completely fine. The other thing that I also learned, actually, that I think is quite interesting, and this is a bit of a hands-on tip, maybe, that, that, that I think uh, is, is interesting to use as well. What you see over here is a graph of one of our uh, pre-prod environments. So this is actually coming for a, for a new service that we are creating. And one of the things that I actually learned in the last few months is how powerful CloudWatch is whenever you're uh, operationally responsible or when you're also actively developing a service. So maybe to walk you a bit through what's, what's hap actually happening in this, in this screenshot, you can see the green lines that are happening over there. That is actually the latencies that we see for API calls. So you can see that, especially at the start, uh, they were rather high. But some of the tricks that we actually do is we annotate these CloudWatch graphs that our operators and our developers can see with more meaningful information. So we, for example, we had this horizontal line there in the middle uh, that shows, for example, what is the ultimate timeout before the request stops working, because API Gateway has a 30-second timeout. So basically, we always have to finish before that, that happens or you know, it basically times out. There's also, for example, an optimal timeout that we can put in there. So we maybe have actually a, a kind of like an SLA that we always want to complete it in 20 seconds. So that is another annotation that we can make as well. But what I think is actually more interesting perhaps are the annotations that we directly add into CloudWatch for deployments that we do. So one of the things, as was mentioned a bit in the title already, we like to reduce toil. So we like to bring down the amount of operational work. We like to bring down cost. Everyone wins. Everyone is happy. And we basically use these dashboards very, uh, basically all the teams at Steady right now have these type of dashboards in place, also annotate them in this type of way, and also in a very active way are looking into how they can continuously reduce latency. Uh, what is also, for example, the positive or the negative impact of particular deployments? So for example, we recently saw, uh, as some of you may have seen with Lambda, Node.js 16 came out. So of course, you're like, yay, let's install it. It's going to be faster or not. Well, it's pretty cool that you can actually put that change, for example, on a pre-prod environment. You will see a vertical annotation of when that happens. And you can, in real time, start seeing whether that had the desired effect or not. It's a great way, I think, to stay in control and to also keep the feedback loop for developers as, as, as soon as possible. Right? They basically immediately see or they get paged when they screwed up something. The other thing I think that's quite interesting as well is to continue a little bit on with the, um, uh, with the trend about CloudWatch. You can start doing more interesting things with this as well. So you can, for example, you know, we know, of course, that CloudWatch is very good at plotting AWS dimensions, such as CPU usage and memory usage and duration, so whatsoever. But with a couple of clever metric mat, uh, data that you can put in CloudWatch as well, you can also start doing things like, for example, plotting your cost. So since you, for example, know you can look this information up uh, on the AWS website, what one millisecond of Lambda compute costs or what one API request costs to REST API Gateway, you can basically start aggregating and plotting those things also in a trend line. Uh, so you can see over here, this is, by the way, dummy data. I would be fired if I put real one. Uh, but you can see, for example, the blue line over here is the amount of dollar, so the cost of goods sold, in case you're not familiar with that. So basically, what are we paying AWS to handle these requests? And then with a red line, I could, for example, do something like a margin, or I could do my revenue, or I could basically make this into a meaningful metric where someone who is basically looking at this dashboard can immediately take a look at it and see, are we making money? Are we losing money? Did we mess something up with a deployment or something like that? And this is definitely a very good muscle as well to start basically, well, what it actually leads to, if my slide wants to change, is that you can make things cheaper for customers. So this is eventually, at the end of the day, also one of the reasons that we do that. We've done so far, I believe AWS did like 60, 70 price reductions, I used to notice. We've done one price reduction, as far as I know. It's definitely not the last one. So as we get better at this, as we start rewriting things, for example, in Rust, or as we start understanding these environments better, we also will be dropping down our prices even further. Uh, kind of like one, one of the other topics that I wanted to talk about also is, uh, and this is also like a mechanism that allows us to basically operate with high excellence and, and reduce costs to some at scale as well, is that we started creating and provisioning thousands of AWS accounts. Or basically, maybe the number is not so important, we provision AWS accounts whenever it is necessary. Uh, we use a tool called OrgFormation for that. I don't know if anyone used OrgFormation or maybe knows it. One person, thank you. <laughs> a couple more. Yeah. 
uh, but it is a, um, uh, it's a fantastic tool to basically automate. You know, everyone is aware of infrastructure as code in order to create things within AWS account, right? That's pretty easy. We have SAM and we have CDK and all these fantastic tools. What you can start doing with org formation is basically creating all of these different accounts as well. So you can also encode, create and define what your accounts should, should look like. Uh, so you can, first of all, you can, you know, you can specify how many accounts do you want. Is there also like some sort of bootstrap that you want to put in there? So are there, for example, some security control policies or any other resources that you want to create in there? And, you know, in a true infrastructure as code fashion, you can also start creating and, 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 and building these accounts. So as of today, I think we have something, we have in the thousands of accounts, I think, right now. And we mastered this process basically in such a way that we can also start creating and deleting these accounts as we want to. Uh, AWS has actually been super helpful there recently by adding, for example, commands where you can actually delete an account completely and it will wipe it off. You can start tagging these things a little bit more better. So actually, I would, I would even challenge you, you know, if you're maybe bored with infrastructure as code, try to basically start automating this type of process and see what type of benefits this can bring you. Uh, the capabilities basically to create and delete these accounts are basically already there. Then the other thing that we also do uh, quite actively, and this is kind of like more of a thing that I wish I knew before, uh, but if anything, if there's like one takeaway that you have from this talk, it is to use AWS SSO. How many people are using it? Quite some, not enough, I would say. Um, but AWS SSO, you know, you might be wondering to yourself, with so many different accounts, how do you actually keep control, right? Because maybe as a developer, you need to log into a lot of accounts and all that. There are, of course, occasions where you need to do this. And in order to do this, I would, I would recommend you to take a look at a, a, the SSO service. What it allows you to do, I didn't include a screenshot in here, but you basically, as an operator, you get an overview of all of the various roles and all of the various AWS accounts where you can start logging in. And from one central location, you can basically immediately get into that account with, for example, view access or a bit more uh, 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 permissions if you need to do something by hand, which is, of course, always undesirable. But basically, org formation and SSO are really powerful combinations where you can, you know, segregate it but still keep the necessary access to, to wherever is required. And then kind of the last step, I would say, around like the organizational, uh, the operational excellence. Uh, another concept that we actually very strongly use, especially across all of these thousands of accounts that we have, are so-called budget controls and budget alarms that you can use within uh, uh, the AWS console directly. The nice thing about these is actually that while there is a small cost for using these alarms, I think it's something like 10 cents per month per dimension, they can actually save you a lot of pain. So you can programmatically set, for example, a dollar limit that one account you know, should raise an alarm whenever you go over $20 or something like that. But you can even do more funky things with it, as you can maybe see in this email over here. So you could also set this, you could set a quota automatically on the amount of Lambda invocations, for example, that someone can make, or on the amount of buckets that someone can make, or other operations, basically everything that is a chargeable dimension within, uh, within AWS. Uh, and then even if you want to, we haven't done this yet, but I'm actually looking into this option, you could even automatically take action to restrict access towards that account as well. So if you really have developers that, for example, you know, don't want to stop spending money and you need to kind of like take more drastic measures. Uh, if you want to, even the budget controls that you have available could do that automatically for you by revoking the access temporarily and, you know, in sort of like a harsh way telling the developers that it's time to, to cool down a little bit. All right. And then, you know, you might be thinking to yourself a little bit, you know, you're going through all this trouble, you're optimizing, you're shaving off milliseconds, you're creating accounts. What is it actually that you're doing? Well, this is kind of the next release that we hope to, to, to get out to customers in a month or so. Uh, and that's going to be actually the Steady Cloud platform. So you've seen already at the start of the talk that we right now have these APIs that allow you to do particular business transactions with us. They require still like an on-premise system or customers to build something themselves, for example, on AWS. Um, with these capabilities of provisioning accounts, budget controls, and all that, we can actually offer a fully fledged cloud platform now. Um, you might be recognizing uh, some of the icons over here, and that's intentional. So, for example, whenever we say that something is a steady function, we actually provision a Lambda function in a dedicated account for a customer. So that Lambda function will run fully isolated. It will have its own service limits. It will have its own billing alarms and all that. And the same actually goes also for things like, for example, steady buckets. You might be able to guess what service that is, and steady SFTP might also give a bit of a clue away. Uh, but yeah, we're basically at the point right now where we can 
you know, start building these architectures or let actually our customers build these type of architectures directly on our platform, where we basically take care of all of the heavy lifting. So to give you a bit of an idea, this is still in preview, but we have, uh, you know, our own code editors, we will have our own layers, we will have our own opinionated stuff basically in top of steady functions. But under the hood, it is actually a Lambda function where we can start leveraging also a lot of the very smart and very clever things that AWS already has built in for us. So that's what you could take a look already if you have, you know, if you're maybe in the EDI space, I saw a couple of hands raised up, or if you're maybe interested in how we're actually doing this, feel free to catch me after this talk. Uh, I'd be happy to show you some of these services, how we built them, and what it is actually that we've learned along the way as well. So in conclusion, and before the drinks start, um, I, there's three takeaways that I wanted to give you as a bit of a recap. So my first one would be definitely consider building multi-region with serverless. You know, I showed you the method that we are actually using DynamoDB for the backend uh, replication right now. You could also use S3 or as James was showing, even EventBridge has these type of capabilities now. So I would say that if you're in that sweet spot where you already are using serverless, definitely consider if, you know, you can also increase the reliability, improve the customer experience in this type of way. My second takeaway there is, uh, take a look at CloudWatch. You might think of it as kind of like this boring monitoring service, but there's actually a lot of possible that you can do there with alerting, with calculating cost, with, with you know, all type of calculations that you can do, which are super helpful for operators. And my last one would also be, uh, and I thought a lot about what I would actually put there in the, in the, in the line, but I would recommend you to sp split your workloads as much as is reasonable. So not as much as is possible. Don't go completely crazy with this by creating accounts for one Lambda function. But you know, if you see that there's kind of like a reasonable boundary between, for example, you know, who can access these applications or what type of customer's data is stored there or whatsoever, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at OrgFormation, SSO, and see if you can actually programmatically start uh, creating accounts and, and, and leveraging AWS in this way. And that's all I had. Thank you so much.